John, I know it's not John, I know it's Jon, but just great to have you on the rugby pod. It's great to have a Munster South African influence. How are things? Do we call you John? Do we call you JK? No, you can you can stick to JK. I sort of dropped John when I moved to Ireland and got tired of explaining that my name is in fact not John. <laughs> yeah, just JK, otherwise known as John Klein. John. He's, John's a good strong name. But JK is cool though, isn't John. it? Uh, what do the boys call you in South Africa? So you're JK in Munster. Yeah, it's it's JK at home just as well. J- JK everywhere. Yeah, we've just we've, 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 we've stuck with it. Well, let, let's start on that because yeah. like for me, being pitch side where you lads were was just absolutely phenomenal. I know it feels like years ago since the World Cup final and everything that happened there. But just as an experience, mate, just let's start with that. Like, how cool was it? Unreal, man. Um, it was... Obviously, I, I it, it took me about a month to realise I was actually at the World Cup because I was still trying to figure out how I made the Springbok team and then, you know, everything ensued after that. So, um, I, I've, I've got a bit of a lag in my head, I'd say. I only just realised we won the World Cup last week. Um you know, just trying to keep up with, I suppose, all the changes the last few months. It's been, it's been a very upside down kind of kind of year for me, but in the best way possible. Like, I mean, I I never imagined I'd end up playing for the Springboks. Never mind playing at a World Cup for the Springboks. Forget about winning a World Cup with the Springboks. Do you know that was completely different level for me. Mainly, I want to hear about the celebrations because. It must have been a crazy few days. A, winning the World Cup, not many people can envisage it or have lived it. But then seeing the scenes going back to South Africa. Firstly, talk us through the night. You win the World Cup, you lift the World Cup, there's beers in the changing rooms, everyone's loving life, happy. There's budgie smugglers everywhere. Faf's budgie's tiny, but he's still got the smugglers on. Um, but the celebrations there must have been huge. And then t- talk us through the night out. I, w- I want the pure details. The Saturday night, Sunday, then back to... South Africa and how good all those scenes were because it looked incredible. There wasn't much of a night out to be honest. It was a, it was very much a night in. We um, obviously straight onto the beers when we got in the change room. It was all um, all fun and games. A lot of couple of speeches made. Um, you know, a lot of lot of happiness. A few tears. Um, it was it was class. Just the experience from start to finish. And then after that, straight home into the hotel we all locked ourselves in a big room with a load of ski masks and <laughs> got on the booze, essentially it was um no it was it was a serious celebration now long lasting and um yeah i i had to actually leave at me and the me and the wife were over and we had to actually leave at 5 30 um, to go collect my son from my in-laws place we sort of had to go and collect him because they were flying out a couple of hours later, because they they'd, they'd come over to mine my son while my missus um, went to the game, which was you know very very sound of them. So yeah, we ended up grabbing an Uber at five thirty in the morning. Wow. Um, so that was that was a lot of fun. Grabbed the child, came back, and then basically went straight on the beer again. And then my mother arrived to look after him. So <laughs> <laughs> it was um, it was a bit of a passing it from one grand grandmother to another, um, but. No, look, it was it was insane, man. And then Sunday was a full day. Um, I think everyone hit the hay at around twelve o'clock on Sunday night because we had a we had a flight the next morning at like seven thirty or something. So it was on the bus for six o'clock, and then yeah, it was it was a very very good flight. I I've never seen so many people in business class actually trying to get into economy. I oh, really um, reverse. Yeah. I'd, I'd say there was there was a lot of people just trying to escape the escape the general area where we were. It was one of those Airbus A three eighties, you know, where the top floor is yeah. all all business class. Yeah, there was rumours that Rassi was flying the plane. Is this true or not? <laughs> you know, what? It, it could happen. It could happen. <laughs> I'm your pilot. <laughs> he's, he's, he's done a few things. He's done a few things in his life. Yeah, absolutely amazing. I mean, it's crazy when you wouldn't pick it, JK. And let's get straight into your story. This eligibility stuff came in, I would say, more so to benefit the likes of Samoa, Tonga, just to name two, for example. And we've seen that other teams like, obviously, South Africa and your story is probably the headline one because of what you've been through. Just talk us about how crazy that that was in terms of your journey to leave South Africa, the country that you love, that you're from, that you are, 
to Ireland to play for Munster, you get capped by Ireland, which is your adopted country, which we've seen. It works for a lot of players. I'm sure it was absolutely amazing at the time. But then that emotion then to get picked by South Africa while you're still playing at Munster and play for the nation that is your blood to your core. It, like, it's, it's, a, it's a long story. So, like, I mean, obviously it, it starts with me leaving the Stormers at 22 when Rossi gave me a phone call and he was like, listen, I'm going to Munster. I need a lock. Do you want to come with? And that was sort of me just thinking, well, I'm 22. I've got nothing tying me down. Might as well take a chance on it. Um, you know, to then four years later um, or three years later playing for Ireland at the next World Cup, which was obviously a dream back then. Like it was, I, I didn't think, I mean, I think I, I, was, I was eligible on the, 8th of August and I made my first appearance on the 10th of August or something so like I only squeezed in eligibility there by like two days um, and obviously under Joe Schmidt got a got a good bit of game time um, played a good few matches and that was it was a great experience um, playing for Ireland and you know massive honor and um, yeah you know coach has changed and I obviously wasn't what um, Andy was looking for, which is fair enough. You know, um, every coach has his has his um, you know pick of what he wants, and you know, one guy is different from another. Um, and you can see obviously Ireland's Ireland system's working very, fairly well for them at the moment, and Andy's doing really well. So, you know, I've no I've no hard feelings about that. But I'd sort of made peace with the fact that my international career was done, and then. Yeah, the Sunday morning after the URC final, got a call with Rassi, and he was basically said, "Listen, if you wanna, if you wanna come join us for the for the rugby championships, we'd really, we'd really um, love to have you." And obviously, I was still pissed, so um, <laughs> that didn't didn't really remember too much of the conversation. Because you won it in South Africa as well, didn't you? Yeah, we won it in South Africa. Yeah, I was down of in course. Cape Town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was crazy. Like um, went over. I'd say there was two thousand monster supporters, and the rest were all Stormers supporters. So we yeah. were we were up against it, but it was it was a great result for us. Obviously, off the back of what could have been a nightmare season, the way it started, I think we lost five out of seven or something at the start of the season, mm. um, and it wasn't looking very good. But turned that around and ended up winning the cup, which was obviously a, a massive, massive um, achievement for us. As, as a team and as a club yeah back to back to the original story basically got the phone call of Rassi at 9 a.m um and yeah unexpected to say the least uh but spent the next few days sort of debating the pros and cons of it with with my family and obviously off the bat you immediately want to say yes but then you realize there's repercussions and you know there's a lot of things that could have gone wrong since then but I've been really fortunate in the fact that everything sort of worked out for me this year um just signed a new contract with Munster as well which was probably one of the main worries is that Munster wouldn't be able to keep me if I um if I ended up leaving and I mean just after finishing building a new house and have a 10 month old child so I don't think my wife would have been too pleased if we had to mm. had to ship out but we said it was a risk we'd, we'd be willing to take and yeah look I'm incredibly blessed in the fact that it worked out um, yeah, just an incredible turn of events. And then, obviously, my first cap at um, at Loftus against Australia being thrown straight into the mixer was also something I didn't really envision happening. I thought maybe, you know, come off the bench for one or two games and see how I go. But, yeah, Rassi put a little bit of faith behind me and threw me in to start that game. And we won it, and it was just... It was, yeah, dream come true, like a little boy's dream. Yeah, well, it is still history. As they say, the rest is history. I mean, one thing just on that, there was a couple of things. I was going to ask you about how the lads received you. I mean, is is there a kind of banter environment in the South Africa team? But then more so about singing the anthem. And you can say this, you can be honest, I'm sure you will. I'm not too sure whether you've said this before. It's probably an obvious thing. Singing the, the Irish national anthem would have one emotion. But when you're stood there singing the South African national anthem, which is probably something you dreamt of as a young lad, I'm sure the taste was so much more sweeter because of everything that you'd been through previously, albeit as good as it was. Do you know what I mean? I don't know. Just yeah. maybe just talk to us about 
how that felt and then how much stick you got off the, the lads if there was any? Uh, there was a there was a bit of stick at the start. Well, actually, no, the, the stick sort of lasted the entire the entire way through the World Cup, but it sort of got quite funny towards the end because everyone started tweeting, you know, the first Irish international to do this, the first Irish international. To do that. <laughs> <laughs> the lads, the, the lads were were having a bit of fun with it. All right, um, but yeah, look, I I'm in a very well. I suppose it's unique at the moment, but it probably won't be in a few years. Um, in Regards that I played for two tier one nations at two World Cups, um, one after the other. I mean, obviously, very, very honoured to do to do both, and um, then you know to win the World Cup with my home country is, yeah. Obviously, I think you know it's where you grow up. It's it's how you've identified for your entire life. So it it means whole awful lot um mm. not saying that the irish um caps and the irish anthem didn't mean much i mean it's a, it's my adopted country i've lived here seven going on eight years now and it'll be 10 by the end of my next contract my wife's irish my son was born here even my even my dogs are irish so <laughs> uh, an irish wolfhound yeah yeah oh, geez i i wish i've got two beagles and they drive me insane <laughs> useless dogs but that's um, what i mean with your relationship with ireland then because i wasn't aware not that i should have been aware but you've got an irish partner you, yeah your kid was born in ireland i'm right yeah so. yeah, yeah and absolutely yeah. the dogs roots, are, irish. Roots are there, yeah are the roots are there of course yeah. but it's, it is a really unique crazy story was there any chat around the ireland south africa game when obviously the irish beat you boys uh and some of the monster lads were like oh you picked the wrong one there didn't you son yeah, there was a bit of that, but um, who? Pete. Uh, I, Big I, Pete. I won't name and shame. I won't name and shame. <laughs> um, oh, you fucking picked the wrong one, there, fella. <laughs> I did get to send them a nice picture of me holding the gold medal at the end of it. <laughs> I, I think I got one over on him. Ah, um, nice. Right. No, you, you know what? I the one thing that shocked me about the entire thing was how positive the reaction was from everyone. Um, like. All the boys in Munster were just delighted for me that I got the opportunity to play at international level again. Um, I, th I think a, lot, a few of the lads had said to me, sort of, you know, behind closed doors, that you know, would I would I declare? And I always said I'd never declare um, because it's it's not sort of not my place to go looking for it um, because I had I dedicated myself to Ireland, so it wasn't my place to go looking for. Rassi to pick me or you know calling up shark saying listen i'm i'm available if you want me um but you know when the opportunity came by i think the resounding um emotion around it was just happiness um for me and you know for my family and and the same goes from the south african lads i think when i arrived i had you know a little bit of trepidation because i was sort of this fella that previously played for ireland and you know, he's, he's sort of an outsider stepping in, um, and it's not how I was, I was received at all. It was, you know, it was open doors, open arms. Um, all the lads were just delighted to have me there. It was, it was an incredible experience. It was, it was really great to walk into a team environment, and I will say that it's, it's the healthiest team environment I've ever worked in. Um, everything's, every like nothing happens behind closed doors. It's all out in the open. Team selection down to you know, who gets picked and why they're not picked. It's all said in front of the entire group. And it just makes for an incredibly healthy situation where there's not conversations happening behind closed doors, where lads are being promised one thing, but they get another. Um, yeah, no, it was it was just such a positive experience. I can't, I, I can't really say it enough. Yeah, 100%. Now, um, one of the things I want to ask you about the World Cup, uh, what made a lot of news was the bomb squad. The bomb squad got bigger. It went from 6-2 up to 7-1. Uh, what was it like being part of the bomb squad, especially when it was a 7-1? And were you all having a bit of banter? Who's going to cover nine? Who's going to cover... I'll play 13. Were you any, any of you putting your hands up to get in the, in the backs? I, I, I'd say I could put my hand up, but I'd be laughed, laughed out of the place. <laughs> um, but, no, do you know what? There was actually... There was um, a few of the lads who were covering like four positions at a time. Um, and, uh, look, I, I think it... I think it says a lot about how talented some of the players are. You look a guy like Peter Staple was covering, you know, he was covering 
both flanks. He was covering eight. He was covering lock. He was covering wing. Um, same goes for Quaha. Quaha was also covering four or five positions. Uh, it was insane. But you know, with that first, I, I think the first appearance of of um, you know the seven one split or the nuke squad or whatever you want to call it, that um, that game against New Zealand that was uh, that was quite an epic one because we literally all went on at the same time and it was this one for one switch and it was in, it was intense. Um, you know, but it was you know, it was like cool a, to be part of. You know, like in the week when Razzie's announcing that is there, is Razzie like lads? I've got something that is going to blow up, like. This is going to go mental. Everyone, we're going to laugh about it, but it's going to be so so effective. I want to know how Razzie tells the story. Does he tell you like that? Does he say like bomb squad, and then he <laughs> announces there's only one back on the bench? Does he have that crack with you? Yeah, he does a squat drop, and then he says it, and then you know. <laughs> um, no, he's uh, in fairness, he does say, look, this is probably going to cause some controversy, and um, in fairness, he always does put his hand up. He goes, listen, if this goes poorly. They're going to say Rassi and Jacques are the two dumbest coaches in world rugby. Yeah. But if it goes well, it's going to be great. So, um, no, that was, uh, I, I think the first announcement of it was a little bit unexpected because um, the squad's announced on the Monday uh, with a box, yeah. which is, you know, it's different to some teams I've played with. Um, so it's sort of, you've no idea who's going to be picked. And then all of a sudden, the team's just on the, the team sheets up. Yeah. Um, in there. So it was a bit of a yeah, it was a bit of a shock for me, um, especially being picked in the finals team. I I I thought my playing journey at the World Cup had sort of um, ran its course because uh, I it was it was talk of us going seven one against um, against France in the quarterfinal. Then that didn't happen, and I thought you know Russ and Jock they're probably going to stick with with a bit of continuity and. Shit, <laughs> I was shocked. Let me put it that way. Um, but obviously delighted, gutted for the lads who didn't make the make the team off the back of it. But yeah, I know. Such bomb cla- squad. I know bomb squad. What a thing to be a part of, and such class players as well. And you've been on both sides now with Ireland. I know they didn't win the World Cup, but been the best team for so many years. The last couple of years, certainly. When you go back into that South Africa team, and you mentioned some of the players like Peter Steph de Toy, like Quagga Smith, who had a huge input i spoke to jesse creel after the final who was absolutely immense yeah, just give was, us yeah. an idea of a couple of the players there that are the very very best where you've gone in there and you've gone holy shit this lad is incredible i know there's a few but who's the there, one is there one jk it's a good few like in in terms of scrum like to be honest the amount of the amount of work that the props put into actually analyzing the scrum Eating. astounds me. Oh. it astounds me like i didn't think you could put that much work into watching scrums but guys do you know three four hours of just scrum review and i mean if you've watched a few scrums enough. it can get tedious two's, so, two's um, enough yeah like from that perspective you know i i have to give it to them it's it's incredible um ox different level lucid like that guy talk about impact I'd say, you know, you can't really say, yeah, one guy came on and made the winning difference against the team usually, but I think in that England game, he came on the semi-final and he just absolutely pummeled the lads. Yeah. Um, so that was, for, for, from that perspective, I think Ox is class. And then there's a few big, big rugby brains. Like Andre Pollard is, yeah, it's class. Yeah. He knows he knows what rugby's about. Um, I, saw him at Leicester, I saw him at Leicester yesterday and I said, fuck you, Andre, for beating England. And he was like, <laughs> sorry, bro. Yeah, look, <laughs> it's it's just one of those things. He just understands how rugby works. Yeah, um, He's got a real calmness about him and yeah, in general. Um, no, I mean, I could probably name someone in every position that's, that's class. Cause that's just, that's the level the boys are at. Um, mm. You know, JC, as you said, I think he was probably one of the best players at the World Cup this year. Eben, I mean, what a presence, um, physically and you know behind closed doors. He, you know, he, he he's obviously he's, I think he's the most capped Springbok of all time now. Um, mm. You know, he he leads, he leads from the front and he leads physically and he leads with his words as well. 
Yeah, I know. It, I shows, you, it, it shows you how many amazing well, happenings there are I mean. across it's, the world, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost like on the spot. And, and I say this because if we were going to carry on, and naturally we, we were going to talk about Sia. Sia Khaleesi's the front man, right? And you forget that, well, you might not forget that Sia gets brought off after 50 minutes and yeah. then the bomb squad comes on and he takes that as a leader really well. I was chatting to my mate, Roddy Grant, who's at Ulster, and he was like, maybe because Dwayne Vermeulen was at Ulster, but he was like, he's a huge part of the Springbok and the leadership side of yeah. things as well. And you think with Dwayne as well, he didn't play, what was it in the quarterfinal he got? He didn't play in one of the big games. It might have been against Ireland. It might have been, and then he obviously went on to yeah. star as well. But like these yeah. players, not unsung heroes, but just ones, because Sia's the front man, right? He's the front yeah. man that you see and all the stuff, Absolutely, which is yeah. amazing for South Africa. Like all credit to him. He is fantastic. Like he's a great player and he's a fantastic leader. And I think we all buy into him being captain because he is genuinely a fantastic captain. Um, but it's it's so much bigger than that in terms of there's... But Sia's a guy who always says it as well. You know, he, he often says it's not it's not the Sia show. You know, it's he's he's just one of the cogs in the machine. And he's, and now in fairness, he's, he's a pretty big cog. <laughs> but, you know, there's there's a lot of guys that play a big role. You, know, you mentioned someone like Dwayne. Dwayne is also was a very influential guy at the World Cup. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think often the perceived picture from the outside is different from what's going on behind closed doors, you know, what's going on inside. Um, and I think we did fairly well to keep the perceived picture, let them have what they think is going on and we'll just do what we do every week. I think that was probably... The biggest thing for us is we focused on what happened within the team and you know what we were doing for South Africa as a country. And talking about the perceived sort of thoughts of what was going on outside compared to inside, I want to ask you about Razzie's uh, traffic light system because he said it was about the physios. It ain't about the physios, is it? It was. <laughs> it was take the three. It was. It was tactics, wasn't it? So what was happening with the lights? Do you know what I? I'd love to tell you, but I actually don't know. Oh no! I don't think it was one of those. Just a bit of van. Um, no, I, I, it, they, they had a, they had a function. But if I ever looked up in the coach's box, it was probably for them to pull me off in the remaining game because <laughs> I was so, so gassed. Yeah. You know what I mean? It wasn't really. Um, now, it, I, I think it was, had something to do with um, just more or less whether they think we should attack or exit or something like that. Yeah. It doesn't like, like physio, I said, then, that's what Razzie it was wasn't saying. something I, um, I really bothered myself with. Cause yeah. I was like, so I'm never going to, I'm never going to get the message and try to pass it on. I just want to ask on South Africa as a country and moving into the six nations, there's rumors and there's talks of this from your perspective, being in Ireland, but also South Africa, the history and the championship. Can you see it as a natural, thing that could happen in the future do you think it's a positive if south africa because it almost seems like the stars are aligning right the urc there's so many south yeah. africans littered across the world the time zone it kind of fits right I, I i think practically it works better than than probably the rugby championship now would it be sad if the rugby championship went out the door i i think so i mean you have the history of the tri-nations and then into yeah. the rugby championships mm -hmm. when when argentina joined i think it would be it would be sad for Southern Hemisphere rugby, but then at the same time, it would probably be good for world rugby. Um, you know, time zones do tend to tend to affect. I mean, the big topic is probably viewership at the moment. Like, we need to we need to up viewership. We want the sport to sport to thrive and survive. So, you know, we've got the Australian World Cup World Cup next, and then the USA World Cup after that. So, I, I think just a you know, the fact that the USA were given a World Cup is World Rugby is trying to increase viewership. And it, that's a massive market. You're talking 300 plus million people that once they buy into a sport, they're fanatic. So, yeah. um, you know, it'd be good to get into that market properly. So I I, I do think it's probably a, a, a logical move. Um, whether it'll happen, I mean, obviously that's not for me to know or decide. There's people that get probably get paid a lot more than me um, that are in charge of that. Um, but I think it would be cool. Uh, easy for you, I, though, wouldn't it, living in Munster? Yeah, it would be quite easy for me. It would be, um, be very convenient for me. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind it. So JK says it's happening. It's happening, boys and girls. <laughs> yeah. 
it's happening. Might text Rossi and be like, listen, could we paste it in Limerick if we, if we come up here? <laughs> oh. Awesome. Just a line on Graham O'Rountree. He's a former teammate and coach of mine and Goody's, but it's so good to see him. I say happy. He must be happy. He doesn't always look happy, but he looks happy. How's he been for your development? Great. He's he's fantastic. I think as a coach and both as a bloke, I, th- I think he's, he's a great yeah. guy. I think he's a fantastic rugby coach. I, th- I think the biggest thing that works for him is the fact that he's an ex-player. And I mean, not just an ex-player, Obviously, he's incredibly, um, incredibly well, well achieved. Like, yeah, you know, well achieved, yeah. well respected. Yeah. Four hundred and fifty something professional caps. That's yeah, yeah, he's a legend, yeah. yeah like, absolute legendary, he's right? Proper rugby legend, and I think in fairness, he's probably going to become a coaching legend as well. He's, um, yeah, he's he's great at pulling the team together, and he's great at getting the boys to buy in. I think he's got a good team around him at the moment. Um, which has been approved this year as well, added a few more bits to the bits to the puzzle. So, no, I I, I think it's onwards and upwards for him, um, and well, hopefully, hopefully for the club as well. Obviously, over the next few years, Munster will look to win a few more trophies, and we will be at the helm. Um, but yeah, no, I, I I can't speak highly enough of him. I think he's a great fella. Uh, he gives me an awful lot of shit. He loves being called Wiggy as well. So if you want to call Wiggy, him Wiggy. Yeah, no, I've heard he loves that. Yeah, I'll, He loves I'll being called Wiggy. <laughs> Say I'll Google throw that says. a few times in my next meeting with him. I'll go, oh, hey, Wiggy, how you doing? Nice to see you again. Pod, pod, yeah. pod, pod. Rugby pod. <laughs>